I'm going to be speaking coming out of Psalm 15, which was read for us, and I want to talk about true dwellers with God. So please let us pray as we open God's word and hear what he has to say to us. Blessed Father, thank you so much for this afternoon. We know, Lord, that you're worthy to be praised and to be worshipped all the time. And everything that we do, everything we say or think, should be offered to you in worship. Grant that even now as we look into your word, Holy Spirit, speak to me so that you may speak through me. And help each one of us to decrease. And give us a clearer understanding of what it means to live in your presence. Speak, O oh Lord, we are listening. We pray all this in the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know how many of you have observed something that I have seen in many homes that I visit in Uganda. It's actually a kind of custom that you don't find everywhere. But when people come to our home, they seem to think they must cut out that custom. And yet for us, we do not observe it. And I'm talking about the custom of taking off shoes. You know it, don't you? Right? Most people, when they come to our home, they take off their shoes and we tell them, please, you don't have to take them off. When you enter and it gets dirty, we shall do the cleaning because we do it every day. But you know, it's a custom in Uganda, isn't it? And people do it. Homes and families also do have all sorts of customs, norms, habits. Quite often they are unsaid. Sometimes they are said. At least I have one rule in our home that if you are to live with me, there is one thing you don't do. And I always tell any person who comes to us, especially to stay with us for a long time, no telling lies. It's just that simple. I don't want to give you the Ten Commandments. <laughs> but you know the reason why I say that? is because any person who tells lies is hiding something. So there is a lot of sin behind it. So for me, it's the one thing that I don't want. Now, the psalm that we are in the psalm that we are looking at, David asks a very interesting question. He says, Who shall dwell in your holy hill? Who shall dwell there? And of course, his question does beg for some questions, if you wish, because one should be able to ask, What is a holy hill? What happens there? What does it look like? What does he actually mean? What distinguishes it from other hills? The holy hill. What makes the holy hill desirable anyway? Why should I want to be there? But he asks that question, he says, O oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Now obviously the use of the word tent is just a parallel for the word holy hill. Because in Jewish poetry, there is a lot of parallelism. You say one line, you repeat it with different words, but actually talking about the same thing. This at last is bone of my bones, that's one line, and flesh of my flesh. It's talking about the same thing. And that's Jewish poetry. For those of you who are doing theology, you need to understand that. But it also emphasizes in this case when he talks about the tent, talks about the holy hill, it emphasizes God's dwelling place. Who shall live with him? And of course the word holy itself is an interesting one because the word holy is talking about something that is separated, consecrated to God. So you can talk of the Sabbath day as the day that has been set apart for God. You can talk about God's people as people that have been set apart for him. When we have Holy Communion, we do have here the patterns and the chalices, or call them plates and cups. 
Those are set apart. You don't take them to your home and use them for your tea and for your food. They've been set apart for God's service. So we call them holy for that reason. Because they've been set apart for God. So when we talk about the, his holy hill here, we are actually talking about who shall be separated from everything else for God to live in his presence. Or if you wish, if I were to make this conversational, it's like David is asking, who can live where God lives? Who can live the way God intended us to live? What qualities fit us to be his friends? And the obvious answer, because these are kind of rhetorical questions, would be not everyone. But David, can you tell me what kind of people can live there? And David then says, okay, let me tell you about the kind of person who is fit to sit where God sits, to live where God lives. What are the norms? What are the habits? What are the customs? What kind of person? David is not asking for name. You don't say this is my name, so I'm fit to be there. That's not the issue. It's not about your name. Your name never gets you to live on God's holy hill. You know, quite often as Christians, we have a tendency of saying, well, I said a prayer to invite Christ in my heart, therefore I'm fit. Well, friend, we want now to hear what does David say, the kind of person that should actually live on God's hollow hill. I've decided to divide this in about five sections, five qualities. Because he's describing for us, he's trying to draw a picture for us to think about this person. That will be acceptable in God's eyes. So in verse 2 he says, He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. In other words, that person who holds the true confession of God. The true confession of God. The true confession of God, of course, meaning that what you profess is exactly what you live. It also means that Whatever God commands is the life that you will be living. In other words, someone who lives in God's will is the person that is fit to live on God's will. I was listening carefully to my brother when he was praying. And, uh, are you married? Ah. Why are you listening to the prayers? He really revolved around marriage. He's a serious man about this matter. Right? Now, many of you are young people and you're probably looking forward to a time to be married. And he was praying that when you enter marriage, you're pure. That is God's will. That you do not start sleeping around before you enter marriage. But you guard yourself. Listen, when I got into a relationship, and I've told this story time and again, when I got into a relationship with my wife, we set ourselves boundaries. And we decided, what can we do together? Where can we meet together? What time shall we meet together? Why were we doing that? Because we wanted to be pure. That's God's will. If you walk like that, if you seek to walk in God's ways, then you're walking a blameless path in every aspect of your life. That's what he's talking about. So he says that once you say, I am saved, you should be able to live that salvation. You should be able to live as a Christian. You cannot enter marriage and you know you've been sleeping around and you think you are, that you're walking in God's will. That calls for repentance. See, sir, these days, many of your pastors don't tell you these things. Many pastors pr prefer to tell you how to get rich and how to be healthy. It's because they themselves are living in sin quite often. So they cannot talk about sin. David says that the person that shall be fit 
to live in God's presence, that person must live a blameless life. In other words, that when God looks at that person, that person walks the way, the path of Christ. It's Matthew Henry in, one, in his commentary on this where he says, that is the person who has scripture as his director and the conscience as a faithful monitor for his life. See, many Christians have lost conscience. And the Holy Spirit departed from them. They still say that they have the Holy Spirit, but he departed. Because you can't live in sin. And you expect that the Holy Spirit is upon you. You can talk about it. You can do whatever you want. But the person who lives on God's hill must be able to say, I stand before God with a clean heart. But secondly, in that same verse as he concludes, he says, speaks truth in his heart. Now you understand why I have that one rule in our home, not telling lies. Speaks truth from the heart. He's not saying you sound truthful. <laughs> Some people like to sound truthful, like a con man. You know, con men sound truthful. Some of them don't. Of course, they are not professional enough in being con men. Like one time I remember getting some, they say they were coming from Sierra Leone. This many years ago before I came here. And they had these papers and they were talking about gold on a ship. And that it was the, the you know, there was a lot of money to be gained by it. They came to my office. And I looked at them and I said, really? You think I'm a fool? Now, those didn't know what to do. David says, this person speaks the truth from the heart. Not simply to sound truthful, but actually truthful. May I say to you, my brothers and sisters, one of the best ways to overcome the problem of sin is to learn to be true from the heart. Okay? True from the heart. It's not just the words that come out of your mouth. It's the fact that what you are saying is what is within. Because God does not just look at what you say. He does not just look at what you do. He knows what is within. In the secrecy of your life. You don't have to do it in the presence of people. Jesus actually said that people of that sort don't even need to swear. Their yes is yes. And their no is no. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in, Roman, in John chapter 8 that truth will set you free. I like the statement that has been made that if you speak the truth, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> but if you tell a lie, you better have a very good memory. Because it won't be the same a week from now. You may be struggling to try and remember, what did I tell this person? Truth from the heart. When you speak the truth, you're free. You say it, you even forget what you have said. You ask me one year later and I'll still tell you the same thing. When I tell you that I got saved on June the 18th, 1976, I'm telling you, my brother, my sister, the truth. Ask me 10 years from now if the Lord hasn't taken me to be with him, I will still say the same thing. The Lord saved me. The truth doesn't change. That's why he says, you speak the truth from the heart. Learn to speak the truth. But thirdly, in verse 3, he says, who does not slander with his tongue and does, not, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach, a slur against his friend. In other words, he's a true friend of his neighbor. 
a true friend. <laughs> I imagine that on God's holy hill, love reigns. Because when love reigns, then I will not say things about my neighbor that I know as simply mud slinging. But I say things that are useful. You know, you think about your tongue. It's one of the most powerful things. And I know many of you are not married, but let me tell you, most of the problems in marriage are not about physical abuse. They are tongue abuse. A word is said. And the moment the word goes out, you cannot push it back in the mouth. Why did I say it? just won't work? The tongue is the most powerful thing. You know, if, if I were to come to you and I just say, oh, Jane is such a kind person. And you don't know that Jane. The moment you go to that person, you will think the person is kind. Many years ago, I was in senior one. Young man. I was only about 13. But I remember something a teacher said about a student, one of the students, my, my classmates. And this is exactly what he said about her. He said, is your head so thick that you can't take in what we are teaching you? Believe it or not, I remember it. Way back 1969. You think of it, 1969, that's when he said it. And I went through those years of school, every time I would look at her, I would remember it. The thing that you say about another person creates an image of that person to others. Watch it. David says... The people that live on God's hill do not slander others. Do not speak ill of others. No rumor mongering. Rumor mongering, huh, that one. And what David is trying to tell us, the mouth is the biggest gun you have, you know. It's a lethal, lethal weapon. This mouth, this tongue. It's a terrible thing. When you tell someone that one is ugly, finished. You tell a child, you know, some, some people actually tell these things to children. There are children who grow up knowing the only name that they have is a fool. Silly. Stupid. So they grow up actually with a self-image that they are terrible. The tongue. Most relationships are not spoiled by anything else but by what comes out of our mouths. That's it. And David says, if you are to dwell on God's hell, you do not slander with your tongue you do no evil to your neighbor. You do not take up a reproach against your friend. You are a true friend as a neighbor. Are we together? So if you were to ask Jesus, who is my neighbor? I guess you would say the one that you speak about in love that you speak about to edify, to build up, that you speak about to understand, that you speak about to lift up, rather than putting down. When we put down others, we are excluding ourselves from God's dwelling. Fourthly, he says, verse 4, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. 
He who, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Let me look particularly at verse 4, the first part. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. In other words, he keeps company that is faithful, that is true to God. That's it. Post Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, bad company ruins good morals. Now, for those of you who are entering students, let me say something. When you are entering, choose your friends carefully. Choose your friends carefully. Let the vile person not be your closest friend. Let that one be a project for you to witness and pray for. Right? Because the company you keep tells a lot about what you look like by the time you graduate from this university. Bad company ruins good morals. Paul summarizes it for us. As a young man, and I have told this testimony again and again before you. I had a company that spoke obscenities. And you know what? I picked up obscenities and I spoke obscenities until Christ rescued me. Company. What kind of people are you, sp are you spending company with? You know, some of us enter university and it's like, oh, this is exciting to be here. And you do not take any trouble to understand that the company you keep is what you look like by the time you graduate. Watch it. David says, you want to live on God's hill? Watch the kind of company that you keep. If you intend to be a resident of where God is, walk with the people who speak what God wants to say who do the things that God wants to do, who live a life that honors him, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. This does not mean that every time you find someone whom you know is wicked, you spit. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is very simply what is summarized by Paul when he says, bad company ruins good morals. So watch it. What kind of company are you keeping? And his advice is very simple. Who honors those who fear the Lord? Finally, the last part of that verse 4 says, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. In other words, someone who deals truthfully and justly. Our biggest problem in our society today is the moment people start working, they are working to make the most out of other people's pockets. You know, the Archbishop the other day was talking about it. The problem, the thing that drives corruption in our countries is greed. Nothing else. Greed. Please take that. I mean, what is the use of someone having houses and they can only occupy one bed and one room and when they die, will simply find a little space where will inter their body. And yet they think they must hold everything and they try to get it by any means and by all means. Greed. That's what drives it. They don't deal truthfully. They don't deal justly. And they look at other people as simply means to enrich themselves. That's what he's talking about here. Get your values right. While you are still a student. You are going to go out. You are going to get a good job. And I pray that you get a very good job. Right? But don't think your life is equal to what, you've, what you're earning. 
Your life is not the same as what you're earning. You're much more precious than that. If you can be purchased with money, then you're worthless. Totally worthless. So he says here, he swears to his own hurt. Yes, sometimes we ourselves may lose. I would rather lose than gain by hurting others. That's what David is talking about. I would rather lose. And it does not change. If I say I'm going to give you something, I give it to you. Even if I know I would have needed it myself. Who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Oh, I wish that the whole of this country, the whole of the continent of Africa, well, actually, it is the entire world, would read this and understand that the, my life, your life, each of us, our life, is not made up by acquisition. There's nothing wrong with having good things, but do them truthfully and deal justly with other people. You should be able to say, I would rather lose than take advantage of others. That's what we should be saying. That greed which drives corruption excludes us from the heel of the Lord. So friends, as I conclude, David asks the, the question, who shall dwell on the Lord's holy hill? Who shall dwell there? And he's trying to answer this for us. But if I were to summarize everything, I would be asking you a question. Are you truthful from the heart. True to your neighbor. True to the Lord. In any case, you cannot tell a lie to the Lord, can you? <laughs> it's a waste of time. <laughs> True wherever you are. Are you truthful? I was just talking to students this morning who are seeking to enter our law program here. And I was saying to them, you know, sometimes people go through from primary one up to high school. And they've been cheating. The time of reckoning has arrived. Because we have had students here who have come from high school and they've got all the A's. A, A, A. As many A's as are offered. Then you start interviewing them to understand, are these A's really A's? And they start stumbling and muttering all sorts of things. That's not working. Are you truthful? Even when you're in university, are the results that you're getting in your examination your results? Right? That's it. I think I better shut up. Because I'm sure you're tired of me. My brother, come and lead us in prayer. God bless you.